gonna take this compressor off and mount that other VMAC and I don't know how long this compressor is actually gonna sit so I'm gonna put some of this Storex in there that way I know the gas is gonna be good for a very long time and I'm not gonna have any problems with it little dabble do you way too much is good right Good tractors that's been the, the bonus i'm ready for a forklift or even forks for my tractor i figured you've got the crawler loader chucky's got the tractors one of us needs skid steer one of us needs a skid steer i guess yeah that's it. that way <coughs> Do not use knife to open. Well, it's not a knife. Cover. Once again, I'm putting some of this Storex into the, I'm gonna put it in my fuel can because I just got fuel. I know exactly how many gallons are in my fuel can. This fuel can stays in the back of my service truck most of the time. And usually what happens is I find somebody that needs fuel on the side of the road. I give them the fuel in this can, but I wanna make sure I'm not giving them bad fuel. So I'm gonna mix this in the can, slosh it around a little bit, and I'm gonna fill up my compressor. Again, I don't know how often I use my compressor. Sometimes I use it so much in a day that I run it out. Sometimes I don't use it for a month. You definitely don't wanna have old fuel in a in a really nice compressor really nice engine something that you care about and you expect to function every day i expect when i come out this thing to start every single time if i put old ethanol fuel in it and just leave it in there for a couple of months this thing's gonna get all gummed up and i'm gonna have to do you know get another compressor so i got five gallons in here which is two and a half ounces we squirt a little there and that 
Pour it on in, do it again. That's good. When you get a brand new compressor like this, you get a brand new any engine, and it doesn't even matter if it's brand new, all right? If you get a new piece of equipment, a new engine, something with a motor on it that needs oil, always check the freaking oil. I don't know how many times I've read stories and I've had personal friends of mine, they'll get a lawnmower, they'll get a compressor, they'll get something, they'll fire it up, and they cook it within about 20 minutes because it didn't have any oil in it. Now I know these Honda engines won't let you start them without oil in it because it won't start without, there's a little oil pressure, oil level deal in there little sensor for it but just check the oil check all the fluids make sure everything's gone we poured a little bit of fuel in this now you noticed i didn't pour a whole bunch of fuel in here i just poured enough in here to get it running because if you fill this thing up and i turn this valve on and it starts leaking fuel everywhere that's one more thing you got to combat with is a whole bunch of fuel and everything so we're going to check the oil in the engine check the oil in the compressor this is a rotary compressor so it does have an oil and it's all compressors need oil, but these, if they run out of oil at all, like you just cooked it. They don't put up with that. So you gotta check the oil in, which is really simple because there's a sight level right over here. So we already know there's oil in it. Now, I ordered this with a remote start kit. I don't have it on the truck right now, so I had to plug this in. It's really, really simple. You run your cable to your choke. You change a bracket in here to hold your choke cable, and you just unplug this connector and plug it in right here. And we hit the key. We turn the fuel on right here, go this way. Like I said, I don't have my choke cable hooked up, so I have to do the manual choke on it. And that's it, and we see it fires up. So another little helpful hint for you guys, any small engine like this, once you are done using it, even if you're planning on starting it back up in about an hour, I always shut the fuel off and let it run out of fuel. Because from my experience, if I tell myself in my head, I'm gonna run it out of fuel later, I'll never do it. And especially on a service truck when it's bouncing around, it's really bad on these carburetors to have these things just on with fuel all the time. It'll shake fuel and fill up fuel in the in uh, through the intake, get in the engine, all kinds of stuff. So I'm gonna fire it back up. I'm gonna open this valve. And then, man, this thing has an amazing amount of air. Now it's a G30 compressor, so it comes out with 30 CFM at 150 PSI. I think that was the spec. If not, then I'll put the right spec here, but something close to that. Justin and I were talking and I don't even think I need to run a tank on this thing. I think I can just hook my air hose directly to it and it'll put out enough air to where I don't even have to have a reserve. So I'm not even sure I'm gonna use that tank up there. Uh, I do like the tank because it kind of looks like a bomb because of the, you know, the mouth on the side, but you know, the less weight, the better. So I'm gonna start this up, run the fuel out of it. And me and Justin are gonna run and get some steel so we can mount, mount this thing. Rolling with my homies. This is gonna be the very first welding job I've ever done in this shop. I've got my power, I have my lights, and I haven't made, <laughs> I haven't built a welding table yet. So I don't have a welding table, but when you have a two post lift and some uh, plywood, you got all kinds of tables. Um, I've had this chop saw, and yes, I know there's a dirt dauber nest here. This is a very old chop saw. What brand, what brand is that? This is a Black & Decker yeah. chop saw. Yeah. Wow. So um, I've had this thing forever. I. I really don't like chop saws. I, they're like the bane of my existence. I want a metal cutting saw with a big carbide uh, blade. Lennox actually sent me one for a metal saw, but mm. I don't have the metal saw yet. So I'm gonna slap this into the cutoff saw, which I think is gonna be okay. I think it's rated to the same RPMs and everything. I'm gonna check it first, but I've always wanted to try these. And if you can tell, it's got this like diamond edge on it and they're supposed to be, um, you're supposed to outlast these wheels by, I don't know, like four times as much. No, 30 times. Or 30 times? Yeah. You can see the difference in the, the big problem with these is once they start getting down in size, the RPMs start changing. One, for the motor RPMs, because it starts unloading, but two, these get smaller and smaller and they're more likely to snap and break. So I'm gonna put this sucker in there and we're gonna find out and use it and see if it works better. Well, there's two things you don't see together very often. 
Black and Decker and Professional. When in doubt, put it in the machine and find out. Yeah, it doesn't have any uh, 4300 RPM max. Oh, we're over that, I think. Hold on, hold on. 3800 RPM, we're good. That saw just got sexy. Yeah, till you look at the cord. It's not bad. Oh, this must not be the one with the <laughs> bad cord then. I have a chop saw somewhere. <laughs> it sounds so bad when you have a tool and you know you got a tool, you just don't know where it's at and it's something the size of this. But I have a chop saw somewhere that, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's cords. I don't know how it still works, but it works. Yeah, use the proper tool and wrench so you don't round off that bolt because that'd be uh, terrible. There you go. Click, click. All right. Having a little fun at Steven's house today fabricating and um, we had to make square tubing. So they didn't sell any, well they do, but it was past five, we couldn't get it. So we're making square tubing and uh, I really don't need to weld this much, but I am welding this much because it's been so long since I actually used a stick welder that I'm taking full advantage of just having the time to sit here and play with the stick welder and kind of get my skills back. One thing, my welds look terrible, but you can also see I'm dealing with a lot of spatter here. So on this side right here, um, and I think this is my first welds, so they're not looking very good, but all this spatter, we're gonna hit the next side with the HD um, nozzle clean. And I wanna show you, this is the, this is the anti-splatter that I use as well. So we're gonna flip this over, and I'm gonna weld the other side up, and then I'm gonna spray this on there and show you guys the difference. So where you're gonna see your splatter, the, your spatter the most, you're gonna get spatter. The best welders in the world get spatter, guys. And if they tell you that they do not, they are full of crap. Spatter is a part of welding. But, um, I don't know my heats, I don't know exactly where I'm at on this, it's taking me time to figure it out, and we don't want to sit here and, and grind away. Now I don't really need that much, I didn't require that much stuff on there, but I'm going to be putting it to it at different heats, there's going to be a lot of splatter, and um, you can see the table, how burnt up it is. Anyway, so yeah, Steven I'm sure we'll put a link in the description for that, and um, I'm going to show you how it works. So I'm using a little Everlast inverter, and... Um, uh, I got it running at about 113 with some 7018 rods, and that's probably a little hot. But I'm going to be playing with it. I'm going to drop it down to 90, and then I'm going to kick it up higher. I'm just going to kind of get a feel for how the welder works. This is the perfect project for that because all that really matters is we've got some decent penetration on this. It's just a bracket, and um, I know it's going to be plenty strong enough because I'm over welding it to begin with. We're welding the entire length. So anyway, let's lay down a bead. All right, now you can see that is a nasty bead. But, you can look here, nothing, I mean there's nothing on there, nothing stuck, good stuff. Okay, let me turn it down a little, alright, let's try 90, let me just push these out of the way. You can see how they didn't stick, you see all those little weld BBs, I can just push them over. See them line up, right there, they get that? Mm -hmm. So yeah, they don't stick guys, and that's a terrible weld, I'm a terrible stick welder. I haven't done it in 10 years. There's everything wrong with that weld. <laughs> but it's strong, it's gonna hold. So if you're a terrible welder like me, use crutches. <laughs> Grinder and paint. Grinder and paint. Make, what is it? Make us the welder we ain't? Yep. All right, Grinder I'm gonna go back to welding. Welder ain't. It's all fun and games until you have to grind your three foot of crappy weld. <laughs> Well, we got the bracket all built. Um, Justin and I have this problem when it comes to building and designing anything. <laughs> if a little bit will do, let's like triple it. <laughs> so we ended up with the world's beefiest elevation bracket for it. We had some, uh, and we ran into a couple problems. We went to, uh, we started looking for steel for this at 506. The steel yard closes at five. That presents a problem. So we had to go to three different stores, find some material, some, uh, some L bracket, um, some angle bracket, weld those together to make some box. That's what these risers are for. So those are handmade. Then we had to make some feet. We had to make, uh, go get the sides. It's just been a big disaster. But it's like any project that you guys do also. You start a project, it's supposed to be a simple job. It's only supposed to take an hour or two. And then you got to get that one particular part of it that you got to run all over town for and then three days later you finally get it back up and going so 
We got this bracket, we're gonna set it down. We're gonna test fit the compressor on here. Now we haven't drilled holes in the center section yet. So we're gonna set the compressor on the bracket and then mark the holes and drill them. All right. Friends to do it right. Just I'll, I'll just say with Sprite. Grab a thrill and a drill. <laughs> okay. Guys, don't do as we do. Yeah! That's how I do it. Oh, no, no, no. And I snoop the old double G and I show the rules away. And I bump it every single day and I kick a little something for the G's and make the friends and burn through. You know it's two in the morning and the pallet's still popping. <coughs> You hanging in there, Hoss? Mm-hmm. Getting tired? Mm-hmm. You going home tonight or are you gonna? Mm-hmm. We'll Go. find out in a minute. You can crash on the couch if you want to. Maybe. I'm pretty comfy. I'll sit up and whisper sweet nothings into your ear. Oh wow. Well, we are done. It took entirely longer than I was expecting, not because of the VMAC compressor's fault, but because I did not contemplate when I ordered this or got it from VMAC that the width of the bracket is wider than this bed. Now this service bed was never designed to have a compressor on it. I mounted a compressor to it and I, when I mounted it, I had to cut and modify the original compressor with this tank. This is one of those Ingersoll Rand compressors that was welded to the top of this tank and I made it work and it worked for a while and it's worked well, but there are some problems with my setup. Every single place that I punched a hole in this for a bolt or drilled a hole rather is cracked real bad. So eventually I'm gonna to have to take this compressor back off, take this tank off and fix this side over here. Um, I've got some future plans for this truck anyway that's gonna come down, you know, hopefully happen next year, we'll see. And I might just, uh, uh, might surprise you the, which direction we're gonna go. but. I'm super excited to have this VMAC G30 compressor on here. Uh, these things, I've used them in the oil field, not this particular model, but other models of VMAX. And man, they have been insane. They make these, they make some that go underneath your hood. The ones that go underneath the hood are pretty cool. It runs off your engine, it high idles your engine. That's about 1000 RPM. And uh, it puts out a tremendous amount of air pressure and volume and everything. You wouldn't believe, like this one puts out 30 CFM, but I think it's 150, 175 PSI, something like that. The whole setup on this thing is top notch. The condenser on it, so Justin was pointing this out and I, you know, I'd realized it, but I didn't realize how cool of a feature this is. So the engine runs the rotary compressor. The rotary compressor, as you compress air, it heats up and it gets moisture in it. So to combat the moisture, they have a little radiator right in here. That radiator has an electric fan on it draws air across it, cools the air down, and when it cools the air down, it knocks the moisture out of it and ejects the moisture. Then you have a little capture tank down here. Now this kind of looks like a reserve tank. It's not a reserve tank. It's actually a, uh, a setup to coalesce. There's a coalescing filter and it's uh, designed to get the oil back out of the air supply because you have a rotary compressor. You need some oil inside there so they have a way to take that out. And then you have your valve over on the side. Everything about this, the, this compressor that we've dealt with so far has been just uh, just absolutely perfect. I didn't have to do anything to the compressor. I didn't have to do anything to the engine. I didn't have to do not a single thing. It just fired up. Rarely do I take things out of the box or package and have to just put fuel in it and crank it and it fires up. Usually I've always got a jack with something. Like I just bought, I just bought this. It's a steel. 
And day one, when I get it home, I've got to jack with the stupid thing to get it working right. You know, the carburetor's not set right. So this goes to show, like, even if you buy, like, still is a really good product, you know, really good product, really good brand and everything, in my opinion. But out of the box, you got to jack with it. I don't have to jack with any of this stuff on this. It's a whole complete contained unit. It's got its own battery, its own engine, its own compressor, um, a little ball valve on the side. Uh, they sent me this cover with it. I got a remote oil drain kit to where... I don't even have to jack with anything on the engine. I just pull the hose out and drain it into a bucket and I've got the remote start kit. And the cool thing about the remote start kit is once it's hooked up, people can't get over here on the other side and start jacking with the controls. And it's one of the reasons that I mounted this compressor this way, by the way. I know some, I'm gonna get some questions in the comments. I mounted all the controls on the inside of the truck because I had the remote uh, set up that I can put down here inside the truck. And that's what I'm gonna do so all I gotta do is unlock my toolbox, open the, you know, the, the door and pull the choke and I can do everything from down here. I didn't want people, if I didn't have this cover on, I didn't want them to have anything that they can get their hands on and mess with because people have a natural curiosity when it comes to this stuff and they'll start pulling, you know, they'll see a ball valve and they'll open it, you know, just to kind of see what it does and leave it open and that can cause problems. But got it mounted to the truck. A huge thank you to Justin for coming out here and helping me with this. He uh, shot a lot and he, he shot, 99.9% .9 of all the video was shot by Justin. Gave me some fantastic ideas about how to do the editing and everything and helped me uh, uh, come up with a design on the bracket. I could have I could have mounted this thing myself, just like any project, you can always do it yourself, but I probably wouldn't have done it, um, the bracket this way. I'm more along the lines of, I start buying stuff and putting stuff together and I go down a huge rabbit hole and three days later, I've ordered special parts and all kinds of crazy stuff and Justin was like, no, man, we'll get two angle brackets, you know, uh, two L brackets, we'll put, flip this one over, we'll weld them together, and then we got our, you know, square tube that we needed. And I was like, I wouldn't have done that. I just would have waited till tomorrow kind of deal. Um, <laughs> we probably should have waited. <laughs> you know, but it, it ended up working out. A huge, uh, another huge thank you to VMAC uh, for sending me the compressor and let me try it out. I, I really, really hope that if you guys are in the service field, if you guys are mechanics, Tell your company you work for you want VMAC compressors. If you're gonna spec out your own truck, get a VMAC compressor, get one of these G30 units on it, or you know one of the underhood units or something like that. Every single truck I've ever been around that was in the service field, in the oil field, there's a couple of names, and once you have these names, like maintainer beds. You got a maintainer bed, the other mechanics around you are jealous. If you have a VMAC compressor, the other mechanics and the other technicians, if they work there, they want that truck with that VMAC. If they don't work there, they're jealous because they don't have one. And I guarantee you, because I, I used to have this conversation uh, in the oil field all the time. As soon as I started with a company, I wanted to know what, you know what crane was on the truck, what bed was on the truck, and what compressor I had. And I was hoping it had a VMAC on it. Now I got my own VMAC, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. But I hope you guys liked the video. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. If you've got some experience with VMAC, go ahead and put it down in the comments. Tell me your own experiences with the uh, VMAC and uh, how they've done you well or what your own personal uh, uh, what your own personal view of them is and everything and uh, get out and fix something.